This episode of Rookie Hunter is brought to you by the Wild Sheep Foundation. Adventures in sheep country can change your life. And as residents of BC, we're very fortunate to have three different species of sheep in our province. After attending the Wild Sheep Foundation's annual convention, Sheep Show, in Reno, Nevada, we got to see what conservation looks like firsthand. The Wild Sheep Foundation's ability to raise and put millions of dollars on the ground each year to keep these majestic animals on the mountaintops worldwide is unmatched. The Wild Sheep Family is a diverse group of people from all walks of life, and membership is open to anyone. Whether you're a seasoned pro, it's your first time on the mountain, or you just like to see sheep on the hillside, you can sign up and join today. Kelly and I are lifetime members, but you can become an annual member for just $45. You can also become a member of the Less Than One Club, which is the only club you want to get kicked out of. If you've never taken a North American or international ram, you can join us in the Less Than One Club for an extra $25. Plus, Less Than One Club membership also includes entry into a draw for three separate doll sheep hunts, which will be given away at Sheep Show in 2019. For more information on the Wild Sheep Foundation and to become a member, head over to thewildsheepfoundation.org. Hey guys, ladies, I know there's a few of you out there. Welcome to episode 96. Today on the show, we're very excited to welcome back Corey Pearsall. This is his second appearance on the show. Technically, I guess it's three. He joined us for the Jurassic Classic and made an appearance on that episode back in August. This time around, we're talking clothing systems. We used our sheep hunt. Obviously, this year's got a real sheep theme to it. So we used our uh, August hunt as an example of uh, what we might want to consider when choosing a clothing system for that type of hunt. We go over lots of other good stuff. We even get into backpacks on this one. So if you're a gear nerd, you're going to love this one. If you want to see the clothing system that Kelly and I used in 2018, and all of our other gear for that matter, head over to the website. It's therookiehunter.com. Click on the gear tab. You'll see there's a page for myself and a page for Kelly. Each one of those images has a link attached to it. So if you see something you're interested in, click on it. It's going to take you right to that piece of equipment. You can learn more about it. As you may or may not know, Sitka is very involved with our sponsor, the Wild Sheep Foundation. And of course, they're a big sponsor for the Sheep Show. And that's where we caught up with Corey. We invited him up to our very classy hotel room in the Pepper Mill and got into this conversation. So I hope you guys enjoy it. With that in mind, please do support our sponsor, the Wild Sheep Foundation. You can become a member by heading over to thewildsheepfoundation.org. Also, don't forget about North Arm Knives. Get yourself a beautiful blade lined up for the upcoming hunting season. You can find them at northarmknives.org. Dot com. Well, I think that's enough out of me. Sit back, relax, crack a cold beer, and enjoy episode 97 with Corey Pearsall. Oops, somebody just knocked on the door. Oh, it's probably yeah. housekeeping. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hi. We're okay, thanks. Good to see you again. Good to see you guys. Nice to, uh, yeah, we've, I guess we did one Skype call with you. The rest were all in person, which is always good. Skype's not fun. I don't know. We don't enjoy it. It's better yeah. to, yeah. one-on-one's always nice. I'll take the uh, like, boat launch. Yeah, the again. boat launch was uh, good yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, On the picnic tables. Yep. <laughs> yeah, the Skype has a slight delay and obviously we can't see each other. So that adds uh, yeah. a dynamic. But. So anyways, it's nice to have you. Yeah, thanks. How guys. you been? I've been good. Busy. Yeah, I bet. Yep. How many shows have you done so far I've really this is just hitting number four for me okay um but for work i've been doing a bit of travel yeah um uh, for some other things right but, uh consumer show wise yeah i think number four this is i'll be getting back home after a 10-day stint which doesn't really sound that long but kind of back to back to back travel yeah especially evening. when you got kids in that too huh? yeah i definitely appreciate my wife <laughs> yeah. I don't think she appreciates me right now. <laughs> Probably not. No. But I do miss I do miss my kid, uh, my yeah, kiddos. I bet uh, yeah. two little duders. How was the uh, rest of the season for you? Did you get out much? Or now nah, this year, I don't want to talk about this season. Okay, <laughs> don't worry. We had a similar season, so it's okay. <laughs> no, this year wasn't uh, this. This year was more um, demanding work wise. Normally, right. you know, everyone's like, "Oh, you work within the hunting industry, so you don't get to hunt." Uh, too bad. Uh, I mean, we cultivate that at Sitka. Like that's a thing that we have to do. So normally I'm out 20, 30 days, no right. problem. Like that's, that's easy to do. But this year was just, it was a good year. It was a busy year. 
Um, so just just kind of focused on that, which yeah. is okay. I yeah, accepted yeah. that this season. Well, you said you had uh, your freezer was looking pretty healthy anyway, so there wasn't the added pressure of getting out there. So that's a good problem to have. Yep, yep. Yeah. Was, uh, yeah. That plus contract killer. So I had a couple people drop off a couple doughs for me. Oh, nice. They, nice. Um, so did some processing, filled up my snack sticks. Perfect. Yeah. Introduced a couple people to to making snack sticks. Oh, cool. Did you take them through the process with yep, you? Yeah, yep, nice. A, a good buddy of mine who's got uh, two boys. Cool. His name's Trent, and just trying to help him uh, introduce him to a little bit. Yeah, that's fun. Organic, right? I don't know. Can we? We can call Wild Game organic. I think here, right? so. Yeah. Let's do that. So, yeah. Let's do that. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, he appreciated it, and I just keep restocking his freezer. Excellent. Cool. Good deal for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> guys like you are good friends to have. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we were handing out, uh, well, we got a spring bear that was our only uh, animal last year, but made a good point of handing those out to people and sharing them because it's good conversation starter in that, right? So yeah. helps our community. Yeah, I, I think so. Especially with yeah. a bear because people are always pretty cautious with it, right? And then if you can get them to try it and, you know, talk about bears and that you can actually eat them and all that kind of stuff, it really opens up their yeah. eyes too we, we've talked about this a hundred times but i just think it's cool to be able to share wild game and and uh tell people where it came from and even within the hunting community it seems that bear sometimes has a bad reputation in terms of like oh no it doesn't taste good it's fatty it's this and that yeah and that that was kind of the reason we went there and mm-hmm. we got one ourselves and i mean i'd go again just because the meat was great so it's one thing i need to do i always seem i always think about bear hunting in the spring and then get distracted with morale hunting morale mushrooms oh right so i'll carry my gun with me and then be like "Ooh, a mushroom <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> but this year uh this year i'll actually be joining uh todd barton uh with bha oh cool uh on a uh on a bear hunt spring oh, nice. bear hunts uh out of montana so nice. i'm really looking forward to that nice mm-hmm. yeah I bet. that'll be a good one mm-hmm. so we're at um wild sheep foundation a sheep show in reno I don't know. I know you guys were last year. How many times have you guys been like one of the main sponsors for this event? Oh, man, before I started, yeah, Sitka, so it's been I'm pretty going sure. on for a while. Yeah. Eh? Why is this partnership important to Sitka? So for us, the experience of sheep hunting is is one of those like I don't know. It's a pinnacle thing. Yeah, spending that time in the mountains and without the support and all the efforts that the sheep community does right wild sheep foundation at the top and then all the chapters and affiliates i mean uh supporting top down and and just seeing the results and the and and what they do and how they give back and that's important to us right like we were talking about before we probably hit record yeah was the holistic lifestyle and just thinking about our ecosystems and their entirety and they're such a they're an animal that is so majestic yet kind of so what's the word i'm looking for like uh i mean movie right like that's something yeah. that will quickly fragile yeah fragile is the word that i'm looking for so having that support and the research um and having the right organizations the right people involved and in driving it in any way we can support that right we're not experts in that category so let's support those people that know how to find the right experts and yeah and find a solution before yeah. i dive too deep into Anything else with those guys? They've got some great things like the, the uh, Nebraska, I believe it's not the Nebraska chapter's got something uh, special right now where their sheep are pretty low hmm. uh, in terms of elevation. So they're really accessible. Okay. And so they're able to actually monitor the same sheep um, to really learn more about those diseases and their impacts, et cetera. So uh, the whole community supporting that chapter right. and how it's going to benefit everybody is something that I personally am excited about right yeah. now in this moment, but anyway, very cool. Diving into the weeds to that question. So yeah, no, that's good. Uh, any other projects that Sitka is involved in right now that you're excited about and can talk about? Yeah. So we've got our ecosystem grant program, uh, that's launched. Cool. So that's online right now. Definitely check that out. So anyone that has any projects from, you know, a national to just an independent, you know, project that you might have, you should yeah, go and check out the guidelines yeah, for it. Yeah, check out the guidelines for it. Yeah, I'm really proud of that. Nice. I'm, I'm hoping from grassroots up to, to larger projects that we're able to benefit. Like universities and that kind of thing? Yeah. 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 Nice. Very cool. When did you guys launch that? Um, so we've been talking about it for a while, but it just launched, uh, I'd probably say three weeks ago. Okay, cool. Yeah. So it's fresh. Yeah, fresh 2019. Nice. <laughs> 
What, what, what else you guys got uh, on the line for Sitka this year for clothing and stuff? Any items you're excited to get out there? Or? We've got, um, you know, we, we've got the new women's waterfowl category okay. that we just introduced, which I'm excited about just because, yeah, I mean, there's, I believe more in the, in the dynamics of women hunters, there's more women hunting waterfowl i believe and that don't maybe fact check me on that one but that's i feel like that's what i've heard and that was a gap that we had so i'm really proud to cool. introduce that yeah uh and then it also completes our uh kind of completes our system so now we have youth we have women's right and we have men's and complete systems between categories so right white tail waterfowl big game or spot and stock nice. nice yeah and then obviously we have some individual key pieces that that we've updated yeah. or you know have introduced uh such as our our uh, flash shelter is a new thing that we've got hmm. uh which is the first uh concealed tarp okay mm -hmm. so excited nice. about that being able to print on that material yeah uh, nice. as a feat yep. very cool you guys have had this for a while now but you got a training line too eh yep training yeah. travel workwear which we approach it the same way we approach like the big game whitetail waterfowl each one of those independently uh serve a purpose and then we yeah. focus on the product design for that category so still uh fit for use you know purpose built yeah product too very cool more of the solids coming in too it seems yeah which is, which is really cool i know a lot of folks are kind of moving to the solids nowadays hunting solids yeah, yeah. we've got some of our key pieces are available in multiple yeah. colors there's some in black, obviously no one like downtown black's okay, but yeah. black's the worst thing that you can wear in the field. It creates a silhouette. Right. Yeah. So you want to stick with those more natural tones. What's the split between uh, camo patterns and solids? Is it still dominant? Like camo? Yeah. 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 High, to, high, like, I don't know. I'd be lying to you if I gave you a percentage, but yeah, right. yeah. I just know that it's certainly mostly camouflage. You found the solids for me for the stuff that I I wanted, and the thing I like about it is my wife will let me wear it when we go out. So it's perks there, <laughs> multi sure. multi purpose. And <laughs> camo comes out, she's like, no, put that back. So casual camo, yeah, <laughs> she's nope. not into it. No. Uh, <laughs> no, it's. I mean, that's kind of the for TCW. What I've really learned. I mean. From personal experience, I wear black diamond because I'm a rock climber. Right. And I want people to recognize me as a rock climber. Mm -hmm. So I wear our TTW, as we call it, training travel work, where right. I wear that because I also want people to recognize me for what I also believe in in my lifestyle, which mm -hmm. is, you know, hunting. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one of the things that we've felt is important to the community is for us to be recognized for what we believe in and where we belong. Very cool. We mentioned this to you last time we were chatting, but we've had guys reach out to ask for advice on Sitka gear, like which I've got this hunt plan, what should I buy? I'm like, I don't know, man. I don't work for Sitka gear. So I thought what we could do today is <clears throat> maybe, so we've got our Northern BC sheep hunt plan that we've told you about. Mm -hmm. It's officially booked. We got this. Nice. Yeah. So that's happening uh, August 18th. We're going to be flying out. And I guess if, if we use that hunt as an example, and somebody called you up and said, hey, this is what I'm doing. We're, we're going. Uh, Mid-August, sheep hunt, what do I need? Yeah, man. So, sorry, I'm going to cough. That's okay, go for it. <clears throat> I'll do uh, uh, edit, Mark. There we go. <laughs> I sh you know what? We should have started with the fact that I have laryngitis, so this, yeah. isn't my, <laughs> this isn't my normal voice as I'm talking. Um, <laughs> you sound sounds, like you've been smoking a lot of cigarettes since the last time we talked. Sound very, I feel like I should be a monster truck announcer. <laughs> Monday, Monday, Monday. <laughs> um, but, uh, sorry, total... total uh, sidetrack there so sheep hunt in august we obviously make a lot of product right which can be really distracting or overwhelming yeah and it's important to first understand that not you don't need everything right right uh some pieces are niche other pieces are designed maybe for that activity other pieces you don't need um and so I always start with, you know, don't ever hesitate to call us. I think that's what we talked yeah, about yeah. last time. Do not ever hesitate to call our customer service team to really better understand what your needs are, as well as if you have X, Y, and Z, what else do I need? But for a August sheep hunt, and I usually like to start from next to skin, working my way yeah, out. Yeah. I, right now with our new Merino line, which we introduced or we rebuilt, we've had Merino for a while, but um, we've re-engineered it. It's now core spun. So Merino outer with a nylon filament inner. That's not 
industry braking that's been around for a while but what it does do is it increases the durability so pure merino wool which is what our merino used to be picks and you get spreading yeah yeah right and you're like what's going on that's just the the nature of merino wool which is an advantage of synthetic for sure our current merino wool has that nylon core so it gives it the strength of a synthetic uh, with all the benefits of merino wool we've also reduced the micron of it so it's down to like a 17 micron Uh, what that just basically means is it's more durable it's not as abrasive against your skin right so it's lighter more comfortable and more durable yeah and then I think we offer it in a zip. Yeah, the core light at 120 grams. Uh, so it's a lightweight merino core zip T. Cool. So that would be what I'd recommend for your Nexus skin. So merino's advantage is that it's it's um antimicrobial. So mm-hmm. it's going to pretty much kill the body odor that you create. Right. right. And then it it doesn't dry as fast. Everyone says it wicks. It it pulls moisture off your body so your body can stay warmer, but it doesn't necessarily dry as fast as synthetic. But because it's so light and it's core spun, it's going to dry faster than just an all merino wool piece. Yeah. Right. So I'd at least have one merino. And then if you're going how many days again? 14? Uh, 12. 12 yeah. days. Yeah. So I'd, I usually recommend another next to skin piece and then I'll say a synthetic. So you have one merino, one synthetic. Right. And I love our core lightweight hoodie just because of the built-in features with the face mask and the yeah, hood, absolutely. Bit, concealment, et cetera. We so have I'd, the core heavyweight, I think, and that's like our favorite. I piece. wear that thing constantly, man. It's just, I love it. It's super yeah. comfortable. I just like wear it around the house and shit like that too. It's great. It's one of my favorite pieces yeah. and it's so versatile. And that would be the second piece or in mm-hmm. your layering system that I recommend is that core heavyweight zip tee or core heavyweight hoodie. Personal preference right. at that point. I like hoods. I don't like too many hoods, right. but that particular product I really like because it does block a little bit of wind uh, off your neck when you're sitting glassing for long periods of time. It's it's not you know 100% windproof, but it's just a little bit extra. So then you don't have to bring an extra little lightweight beanie, right? right. You've got mm-hmm. it built into that product. I too often put something in a pocket and I'm like, is it theirs? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like which, where did I leave it? Yeah. Uh, so with it built in, it just adds that convenience. So Merino, core lightweight hoodie, and then a core heavyweight hoodie. Right. to back it up one more layer. You guys have underwear too? So we do. Uh, we make merino yeah. uh, or a synthetic. And uh, obviously the one thing most people overlook is cotton underwear. They just take their normal underwear out there. And then yeah. it's not the most comfortable thing to be hiking around. And one, it's just balmy. Right? Yeah. And then two, our waistbands are a little bit more comfortable with a heavy load. Right nice. way, so uh, always something to consider. Yeah, it'd be nice to have a couple of those because so they dry quick too, so you can at least clean them. You can clean them, yeah. Go <laughs> synthetic the and then hang them up. So, yep. Yeah. Yep. I do the synthetic. I do like our merinos because they're longer and so they give you a little more compression around yeah, the thighs, right. but I do like our synthetics because synthetic's always going to dry faster right. than merino wool. I find the, um, the waist, waistband area is really important because you talk about boots and your feet and, and all these high priority areas for pain but if you don't have your waistband set up right like you have suspenders in the wrong spot and you get all that compression with the pack and you go for a like eight hour hike there's going to be some sores and welts and you know things that pop up there that that's what happened to me anyways that Mm -hmm. was my one from our you know we call it a sheep hunt experience that was where the pain got me was was just dealing with that and yeah. waste. Yeah. I just made sure I loosened everything off, kind of moved it around, readjusted and it was good, but yeah, not to overlook. Nope. Sorry. Sidetracked. Yeah. No, that's good, man. It's important. Yep. <laughs> so from, uh, intermediate layer insulation, August, I'd probably suggest sticking with our Kelvin light hoodie. This is just a really versatile insulation piece. It's yeah. one of the pieces that I nerd out the most about okay um so you've got an active insulation traditional insulation that's the kind of the fad or trend these days is active insulation active insulation and it is it's important and it's great for the right application but what people don't realize is it's not the same as traditional insulation and then just more breathable Mm. it's highly air permeable and air perm results in convective cooling Mm. so i might take a step back here but so air perm is the wind coming into your environment, your internal, your clothing environment, right? Uh, breathability is purely moisture moving out mm-hmm. without any help from air perm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah. kind of understanding that. So when we talk about breathability, we just talk about the movement of moisture outwards. Air perm is 
air getting in. Sometimes right. really good. So if you're active, if you're hiking a lot, yeah. active insulations have a higher warmth to weight ratio. So they're lighter, more compressible, but warmer than like a fleece layer. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of active insulations are great as a fleece layer, but not as your insulation that you're so accustomed to. Gotcha, yeah. Because air perm in results in the convective cooling and sitting on a ridge glassing for many hours, you don't want that. You don't yeah. want the wind to steal your body heat and you want to sit there and be comfortable, right? Yeah. So if you only bring uh, an active type insulation, more than likely that you're going to chill, you're going to have a a worse experience. And right. I've already had some people call and say, yeah, I bought this thinking this was the right thing, active piece. And oh, tell me what you were doing. Oh, now I understand. Mm -hmm. um, because it's a, you know, everyone's excited about it because everyone's talking about it. It is a great thing in the right situation. But again, you always want to consider what tool you need. You don't want to take a screwdriver when you need to hammer in a nail, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So same conversation here. Great item for the right situation. For this particular hike that you guys are going on, you already love your core heavyweight hoodie. So you already have a fleece intermediate layer. I'd look at an actual traditional insulation type piece. So like our Kelvin light hoodie. Mm -hmm. So what we've done with the Kelvin light hoodie to promote more breathability, right? We're system focused. We don't just build a product and say, here you go. We build everything we add. We're making sure that it works in conjunction with an entire system, right. with what we already have, making sure that it for some reason isn't reducing breathability because mm -hmm. of whatever fleece face is on the next layer. And so Kelvin light hoodie, uh, what we've done with it, which is a little bit more unique, is we've used a more open textile on the inside, uh, which is referred to, I believe, as uncalendered. And that's just going to promote more moisture movement from the inside of that garment outwards. And then the face of that Kelvin light hoodie is calendared, which means it's a little more wind resistant, like a traditional insulation. And then primal loft insulation that we're using is called high loft. That is already a little bit more wind resistant as well. So you have the wind resistancy of traditional insulation, but with increased breathability, right? And actually talking about breathability, moisture movement, not wind stealing it on you. Right. And then we've mapped active insulation in the armpits. So that is giving a little bit of convective cooling out from your arms to help regulate the body overall. So it's not necessarily allowing wind from the core, but it does allow for a little bit of increased breathability or just a little bit of convective cooling in certain spots that are, you know, your armpit, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thus pit zips in some pieces. Right. So yeah. what's neat about that is we were using Polar Tech as well as Brahma Loft in one piece, which surprisingly there's not many companies, if any companies using two different brands of insulation, oh, okay. right? Not a big deal, right? That just makes sense. Yeah. Using the right insulations in the right places yeah. uh, to map it and then using the right textiles to promote increased breathability or moisture movement outwards for increased thermal comfort, right? Yeah. So that's, I love that piece. That's my favorite piece, the Kelvin light hoodie. Hmm. So that's what I'd recommend for that August hunt, cool. right? If you go start to go later, maybe a little bit more insulation yeah. than the Kelvin light hoodie, like our Kelvin down with right. upper hoodie. But for that trip, I'd take the Kelvin light hoodie. Cool. And then an outer jet stream jacket. Yeah. Jet streams, right? The yep. soft yeah. shell. They're awesome. Yeah. That yeah. one right there. Again, um, wear it all the time. <laughs> the, You're allowed to because it's solid. Because it's a solid color, right? <laughs> that thing, there's, I want to say Mountain Hardware pioneered wind stopper soft shells. Okay. So like technical soft shells. Yeah. And that's what the jet stream is really designed around is a, a durable, quiet wind stopper yeah. piece. So light fleece, right? Not a heavily fleeced garment, mm -hmm. but light to midway fleece, pit zips, lots of pockets, lots of organization, yeah. really durable, yet something you could easily stalk in. So it's a really versatile piece depending on what the conditions are. If you're on horseback or if you're going through heavy willows or uh, high wind day, yeah. but might still be pretty warm out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a the go-to piece. Uh, again, the wind stopper makes it 100% windproof, right? So yeah. now you can sit in glass and now you're totally protected, right? You've got your insulation, you got your jet stream jacket on the outer side and it's blocking all of the wind entirely. And you can still stalk close to that sheep, right? Because rain gear, although phenomenal is noisy right? yeah yeah um and it's meant that way because you need the abrasion resistancy that increases the durability but it definitely comes with a little bit of noise so unless it's yeah raining yeah yeah right rain brings all that uh, ambient noise for sure and ambient coverage and so you can still stalk in but let's say it's not raining it's just windy yeah yeah right and you don't have your jet stream jacket now you're kind of all right do i put this noisy rain jacket on to keep me comfortable do i deal with being cold that just really 
make sure that you're prepared for all situations. Yeah, for sure. Speaking of rain gear, does Sitka test their rain gear against bear spray? Do you do any bear spray <laughs> testing? There's there's more to this. <laughs> so I don't know if you heard, but um, I haven't heard. I want to know. <laughs> so I did I'm some... silently laughing here because we have. So Gore has this like thermal chamber that is like it's a comfort room that literally simulates like everything down to the sun movement. Okay. Like literally the UV. Oh well. Whatever. I mean, it's well beyond my knowledge, but we can simulate every situation yep. via the weather. Haven't tried that one yet. Bear spray? I don't know if anyone's <laughs> tried it yet. I, I, am, I know a guy. I do. <laughs> you tried it against yourself? Uh, in a way. <laughs> so uh, on this moose hunt we went on, I got up. It was like one of the best mornings I had to the trip. I got up first person up, stoked to go. You know, we get to our spot. We're going to hike into a lake. And I bend. I, it was raining a little bit, so I had my rain pants on. And you know, the pockets and the cloud burst are in the front. Mm-hmm. So I just thought, I, I'll just throw my bear spray into the front pocket for oh, a second. No. I bend over to pick up my rifle because I had my pack on. Mm-hmm. And I just heard, and I didn't know what it was. So long story <laughs> short, it went off. I managed to throw it away uh, pretty quick. I didn't breathe any in. It didn't get on mm-hmm. my face. But my entire arm was covered in orange. It hit my belt pocket on my back and that kind of protected like it shooting up into my face yeah but um that whole pocket was just full of liquid like bear spray liquid and um yeah it was but i'm so happy i had that rain gear on because it protected everything you know you don't want that stuff on your junk no so, <laughs> the last place you want it <laughs> so it's um, like 10x icy hot <laughs> yeah so yeah. um yeah it's a good thing i had them on um but uh, yeah, I ended up taking them back to the lake. We, I ended up walking to the lake actually and hunting until noon. Yeah. And then by that time, I just felt like my hand was like three times bigger than it actually was. Yeah. That- so we just went back to camp and I ended up putting my waders on and just like drenching it with Dawn soap in the lake as, as long as I could. And then when I got home, I used, um, what do they call that soap? It's like cream. No, like Nivea cream almost, but it's like a cleanser. Mm-hmm. And I read online, like, just you know, rub that in there and just keep rinsing it out. The problem is now my rain pants smell a little bit like Nivea, but I think that'll go away. <laughs> so, the, so they held up. So they held up, short story. Never made it to your thigh? Like nope. you never felt any of that pepper, nope. spice, burning? Nope. No? And I literally had a pocket full of bear spray. Yeah, it's the... so. The nerdy side of it is the EPTFE membrane, uh, expanded polytetrafluoroethylene material. You can pour battery acid on a Gore-Tex mm-hmm. jacket, and it's going to eat the face fabric. But it's going to the the EPTFE is such a high surface area that it doesn't get any penetration to it, wow. so it doesn't saturate through. They put the same material that well, slightly changed and altered, but basically the same concept into heart valves, vein stents hmm. that will also allow like tissue to bond to it Mm -hmm. and people's bodies for the rest of their lives it's an incredible like material that can be used for so many purposes aka pocketing bear spray (laughs) save it for a later day just in case you ever want to know (laughs) yeah there you go where'd the safety go that's my question yeah what i was wondering how that popped out what happened was when i bent down the belt pouch it must have just moved a certain way maybe i turned a little bit but it just shot the safety off and then me and pushed it down at the same time what are the chances yeah that's uh that's some bad luck that is that's yeah. uh I mean, it could have been worse i mean you guys could have been oh, yeah. done yeah. right like that could have finished, finished that hunt. my hunt anyway <clears throat> yeah. yeah my dog in college days we put him always in the room when we'd have you know a house party and uh every time we'd get close to my room everyone would have like a an itch in their throat hmm. <clears throat> scratchy thrill, right? And we're trying to figure it out because you'd walk away and it'd go away and then come back and you'd get it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I opened the door. My roommate actually opened the door. He pukes immediately and my dog jets out. He had been chewing on the bear spray canister oh, and no. there was like a two foot long stain in the carpet oh, no. that he had hit that oh, button no. and yeah. evacuated our house. We couldn't get back into that house for two days. Yeah. I mean, it, we were clear of that house for two days. Wow. Yeah. Unbelievable. Sorry. That was a big detour there <laughs> <laughs> from rain gear. I just, you know, now you don't have to do the test on your own. Sick of rain gear. Yeah. 
I'm not going to say it's going to protect you from bear spray because because that's going to come back and bite <laughs> Kelly, me. But Kelly can say that. Yeah, yeah. It's. I mean, it's a small sample size, but I'm confident. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, then you need rain gear. That's it. There's your story. Cool. There, there it is. Uh, system. I mean, pant wise, the only thing I didn't really talk about uh, specifically are, are bottoms. So I always say stick with merino as well. Yeah. Um, depending on what you're anticipating for temps, you might bring like a core heavyweight bottom. Yeah. Just like you've got for your top. But that one just depends on if it's going to get probably down into the single digits or low teens. Yeah. So that's the thing with um, Northern BC at this time of year. We could be 30 degrees one day and we could have snow the next day. Yeah. Hopefully we don't, but that's very possible up there. So nope. you yeah. kind of have to prepare for every scenario, which is a pain in the ass because you're bringing more stuff than you need potentially, yeah. or you're bringing stuff that's going to save your ass too. Yeah. So I, they're light enough. I'd bring them um, with you guys, and then you've got Timberline pants, yeah. primarily because of the reinforced knees, reinforced seat, removable knee pads. So you've got the yeah. waterproof butt, yeah, uh, waterproof knees, kneeling, sitting sign down screen fields, et cetera. Yep. It's yep. just going to give you increased durability. And it's the right insulation for that timeline as well. You've got good um, air perm, the right amount. Right. Uh, so you're going to be pretty comfortable with those. And then I don't, I wouldn't recommend puffy pants for that trip. Um, yeah, I don't think so. And then the, yeah, just rain pants. And you could do storm front or cloud bursts specifically. Um, I think... Storm front for those extended trips. So like you're saying, 12, 14 days. That's usually when I recommend our storm front line just because it's more livable, a little bit more convenient. Okay. All rain gear is equally waterproof from our category, from our product, right? Not yeah. all of it across the board industry-wise, but our rain gear is going to give you the same amount of waterproofness. It's just more or less the feature set or the durability or the weight. Okay. That's what you're looking at between our lineup. So I think you'd be great in the cloudburst as well. But if you just want a little more livability, if you're expecting to be in rain for 10 days, then I'd go, I'd go storm front. Is there a big weight penalty from cloud burst to storm front? Not too bad. You're looking at about 24 ounces in the storm front in a size large, and then looking around 19 to 20 ounces in the cloud burst. Okay. So nothing drastic. Now we do have a dew point, which is one of my favorite pieces. And unfortunately we have discontinued it. We still have some in, in inventory right now. Okay. That thing, if you are aware of your surroundings or conscious of your environment, right? So you're not busting through cat claw, mm. uh, you're not sliding down. Well, I mean, you shouldn't slide down scree fields intentional. Well, in rain gear, anyways. The dew point is is going to be great. It's thirteen point six ounces in a large, and I mean, with the pants, it packs into a little bit bigger than a softball size. Right, and it's a three layer Gore Tex. So, unfortunately, with rain gear, when you do really, really start to count ounces and you get below a pound mm-hmm. in a particular garment, it can be pretty fragile. That is not the case with the dew point. It is rugged. Okay, it's, it is the lightest, most durable rain gear on the market, and so I that would be. Again, if you're conscious of your surroundings, that's my go-to if you're looking about saving weight or if you're shaving your tooth brush down, things like that. <laughs> yeah. That's that's the thing that I'd recommend. I've got, because we discontinued it, I've got two sets. Nice. Um, it's my favorite rain gear. Anything else? Accessories, hats, gloves, whatever yeah. you're comfortable with. I mean, I feel like I skip over hats and gloves. We also have uh, the mountain hauler which is a uh, new for us in terms of actually a meat hauler. Oh, cool. We really haven't had a meat hauler. In our lineup, this one is something I'm really proud of, uh, the Mountain Hauler 62. And then this year we introduced a 4,000. Hmm. 4,000 is going to probably be too small for for your trip, but the 6,200 will be right. And shoot, we could probably fill an hour talking about backpacks. We can do that um, if you're in for it. Actually, yeah. You know what we should do before we if we stay focused on clothes for a sec? Yeah. We had uh, questions rolling in. Oh, gotcha. Nice. And um, I got a couple of questions. Most of the questions seem to be more about how bad my hangover was this morning. So uh, accessories. Best gloves for very wet coastal conditions. So he's thinking Vancouver Island black tail. Gotcha. So we just introduced a new glove called our, well, it's, we've had it for a while, a storm front, but we've redesigned the storm front. And what's really neat about our new storm front glove is that it is fully taped. So traditional waterproof gloves have a liner that basically goes in and then it they stitch a few anchor points mm. into it. Mm. Right. And so it's separated from the face. It's not the actual material. It's just kind of, hanging in there you would never know it but that's right. the way that it is so our new storm front is fully taped like a jacket the same idea as a jacket so it could be just a just a shell glove 
but then we have a fleece liner to it as well. So a lot of times you got to take your hands out and so your hands get wet and then you put wet hands into a fleece glove and then the fleece glove eventually builds some moisture, even though the glove itself is keeping your hands dry, you going in and out of it uh, for whatever reasons are going to get it wet. So now you can take the liner out and you can dry, you can turn the glove inside out and you can hang the fleece liner and dry it in your tent. You can, you know, basically what I do if I need to dry anything at night is I just stick it in my hat box, which is basically as close to my chest or my stomach as possible and just sleep with it there. That's what I would absolutely recommend. I think with the right size, the right fit, you can definitely tie your shoelaces Mm -hmm. with that glove. Mm -hmm. I don't know about pulling a trigger. You might be able to, depending on what the fit's like for you, but I'd probably, I'd probably either try practicing with the fleece glove, right? I'd never recommend just going out and trying to pull a trigger with a pair of gloves on. You've got to practice with that anyway. Mm -hmm. So maybe practice with the fleece liner or I'll also bring them back up. So when it comes to hand, keeping your hands warm, this is an old trick that I learned from a nice climbing partner of mine. Uh, Always have spare gloves and never put them in your backpack. It's like the worst thing that you can do is have them in a pocket in your backpack, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So the idea here is your hands are cold, right? Mm -hmm. Now you're putting on another pair of cold liners. Like your hands are not creating enough warmth right. to keep your hands warm. So putting a pair of cold gloves on is not going to do the trick. So mm-hmm. you have to kickstart that and you kickstart that by putting it in the oven, like I was just telling you. So I always keep a spare set of glove liners. Well, I mean, it doesn't matter where, but like outside my next to skin. So, mm-hmm. but sometimes I'll tuck my next to skin piece in and then just throw them in. Right. And they just stay right around my belly, oh, basically. Nice. That's a good tip. That and is they, a good tip. They stay warm always. And then I switch them out. So I'll take the cold liner off, put the warm gloves on, put the cold ones in the hot box mm-hmm. and warm those things up and just keep rotating that. I'll pass one more question off to you and then maybe we can get back into some, some other stuff from up in BC. He's asking if Sick is basically considering zippered side vents on their pants. There's a couple companies that are doing that. Mountain Hardware and Adisac, who is doing it. I think they're great features for certain pants and certain needs. So the way that we design a lot of our products is understanding what the purpose is and the right amount of air perm. So we're looking, we have a textile engineer hmm. that looks at fabrics and only fabrics. Christina, she's brilliant. Like she knows 10 times more than I'll ever know about textiles and that's her job. And so she's identifying the right textiles for the right situation. And so our pants for the right situation, you shouldn't need to vent it. You should be comfortable, Mm -hmm. right? However, if you, I understand the idea of if we made a really insulated pant, it'd be nice to have a side vent. But right now those timber lines with a pair of long johns and they're pretty much will range and move moisture and retain the heat that it needs to comfortable from you know i say 10 to 30 degrees i mean shoot with long johns underneath it it's zero shoot i'll I'll hike in that and negative five fahrenheit of course i'm talking fahrenheit negative five fahrenheit up to the teens and i'm good now if i sit i'm cold but my legs aren't overheating right they're just staying comfortable so i guess what i'm trying to say is we're engineering them to the point where we don't need uh, a vent for Mm -hmm. them does that make sense yeah yeah but the reality is is we make multiple pants Right. So a vent would be nice for one universal paint. Right, right. Whereas again, we make a lot of products for specific end uses. Right. Instead of a screwdriver, you might need a hammer. Right. That's yeah. same theory. So we have the ascent pant for early season, mountain pant for mid, timberline pant. And what I usually recommend is you don't need all three of them. We usually have them built out to where two pants is going to get you through the entire season without having to worry about additional uh, vents, zippers, things that might fail on you things like that. So the Ascent pant and a Timberline pant is a quiver. You got your early season, you got your mid to late season totally covered with some base layers. Nice. Yeah, I've been using the Timberline since I think 2014, 2013. Like yeah, you've right, had right those right for a long time. Hunting, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I never, like whether it's early or late season, it's never my waist down that has been an issue. All it's right. always kind of like, well, how am I going to plan the upper body? Because the Timberline's just, they cover so much. Yeah, it's about so, comfort, right? Yeah, and it's exactly. hard to explain like your body generates the warmth that it needs to generate. I mean, obviously when you're active, you're going to sweat. And the goal of our systems is to move that moisture so you don't sweat it out, so you don't feel damp and clammy. And thus you don't need vents for your pants. What about somebody who's working with a, with a budget? They can't do the full system. They want a couple of key pieces of equipment. What would you recommend for like, here's two things that you should definitely have and you could supplement that with other cheaper items that you might already have in your closet or whatever. Yeah. A lot of people 
you usually contact us and they already have some base layers. Yeah. And so I usually try to figure out what their real needs are. Yeah. Do you have good rain gear? What is it that you're doing? And so there's some variables there that I'd have to ask yeah. to really understand. And that's what I love about our customer service team is they understand that and we respect that. Right. Um, and we will help under one, understand what you already have, what you're anticipating to go do or yeah. what your primary hunting style is. And then we'll help you understand what first purchase should be. That's right. going to be the most beneficial. Mm. So it's hard, hard for me to say, because in it's, a lot of situations, I'd love to say jet stream, but between you guys, I wear a mountain vest like for September elk hunting. Right. I don't even right. bring a soft shell anymore. Yeah. yeah. I just uh I just go next to skin, an apex hoodie, which is a kind of our new technical intermediate layer. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. basically apex hoodie or that core heavyweight hoodie, mountain vest and a puffy in my rain gear. So if it is really windy, I can just put that rain gear on and then when I stalk, I take it off. Right. So I I kind of figure it out, but my stalks are usually pretty short because I'm not the best archer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, we haven't even gone there yet. So uh, yeah. yeah, I'm sure you're better than us. Let's but put it that way. I would say, I mean, for me. So, yeah, I'll give you, a, what if I give you a scenario? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to hunt mule deer. I live in an area that's uh, pretty dry climate, not a ton of rain. I want to hunt till, I don't know, let's say late October and that's it. So I would do, I would say our apex hoodie. As yep. an intermediate layer, just because it isn't view, it's it's more of a tool than it is just like a piece of fleece. Mm. And then considering either the mountain pant or the apex pant. Okay. Those would be the two things that I'd suggest for simplicity. I'd say apex hoodie, apex pant. Cool. Right. You can remember the the names. Mm. The apex hoodie is what we refer to as I might get a little bit more nerdy. I'm gonna try to just start with what it's designed for sure. and then go into the the what it is. It's really designed for those close encounters where really the last five minutes is what determines a successful hunt, yeah, yeah. right? Making those smart choices. And that's what it's there designed to empower is to help you make the right choice. So um, what that just simply means is it's designed in a manner of one for additional concealment. So it's got the hood and the built-in face mask, yep. super quiet, but mapped with durability throughout it. So if you do have to still bust through some brush, it's going to take some abrasion. Yeah. And then it's got a little front pocket that has a, an internal organized mesh pocket. So two internal mesh pockets. Mm. So um, if you're like our big game category manager, or product manager, he always has a spare release on him. Always. Oh, okay. And so he'll basically drop his pack, kind of just quickly store the things that he needs, mm-hmm. whether it's an extra read, whatever yeah. that looks like, tags, it's cutlery. And he'll be able to make that final approach with just that on without a backpack. Yeah, that's smart. Mm -hmm. And then it is designed with what's called dual face technology. And what that really simply means is it's the face of it is a synthetic, a polyester. The backer is a merino wool, but it's not glued. There's zero glue. It's just knit in a way that puts the synthetic on the outer and the merino on the inside. So we call it dual face, two different faces, right? And so... What that results with is you've got your antimicrobial feature of merino wool closest to the skin. You've got more abrasion resistancy on the outside, mm. right? It's common to make it yeah. say, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. No one else is really doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's a kind of a nerdy piece. Like I said, awesome. it's it's one of my favorites for archery elk. Last time we talked to you, we talked about clothing care. So if people want to check that out, they can go back to that episode because there's some important notes in there just taking care of your stuff because it is an investment and you want it to last long and perform the way it should yeah but if you're just wearing it every day and not doing anything else to it then it's going to start to <laughs> fall apart over time and it's uh there's no way around it you got to take care of it so yeah uh, i've had two conversations i hope i don't insult anyone that i was talking to at this show but i, I spoke with a gentleman who's had our rain gear for five years six years now and he came into the booth you know thinking about getting new rain gear and he was telling me what he was experiencing. And the first thing I asked him was, when was the last time you washed it? Never washed it. Five years. Hmm. Found out kind of how much he's worn it, right? Because yeah. at some point, it you kind of kill it. It, right. it becomes uh, contaminated with oils. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's hard to get those oils finally out of that EPTFE membrane. Um, but he, he didn't really wear it too often. And so, hey man, you don't need new rain gear. Just go wash it. Right. Maybe wash it twice. Yeah. And then apply a DWR treatment on it. And guy shook my hand and 
saved him 600 bucks. Yeah, and, nice. And went yeah. home, right? So caring for your gear is just like changing the engine oil on your truck. Like if your truck blows up because you've neglected it, it's not the whose fault, fault is yeah. it, right? Yeah, exactly. And so just wash it. It's it's something that we could probably do a better job of communicating, but we don't communicate anywhere that says don't wash it. So mm-hmm. I'm always surprised when I hear people are like, oh, I didn't know I was supposed to do that. It's in the hang tags. It's on our website right. everywhere. Don't be afraid to wash your gear. I also appreciate that you guys put, you have like the carrot, like symbols on there, but you also have the, what what those mean because I'm an idiot when it comes to like the triangle and the square and I don't know what any of that shit means but you've written it all out on there very clearly so I appreciate that nope, nope. <laughs> the only thing you really need to pay attention to when you wash our gear is merino wool right and then down right, right. down and merino are the two sensitive things and yeah. down isn't really that sensitive you just have to be aware of what happens when you wash it which means your down's gonna clump and you're like oh my god yeah where'd all the down go uh it's still there it's just clumped together and right. then the dryer depending on what the product is do you guys have the kelvin down yeah. stoppers yeah. with big puffies yeah. so you wash those things they're like gone right yeah. and then you throw it in the dryer and your dryer says it's done and it's like not lofted at all you got to put it in there manually just for like go. two hours yeah, two yeah, and a yeah. half hours you can't overdo it you can't overdo it huh. i mean don't do high heat just yep. do medium low heat for long duration okay. it'll literally go from like compressed to Wow. And it'll just poof right up again. And you're like, okay, here it is. Here's my jacket again. Yeah. Yep. And it's, it's important because what will happen with down is down will clump from those, those uh, sweats uh, or just smoke or right. dirt. Like they're stick to each other and then they'll start to clump. So it's important to wash your down on a yearly basis, maybe every two years. I don't have to wash it too yep. often. Yep. Right on. Do you think we have time for packs? We should save that for another conversation. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, for sure. First question I always ask individuals, because uh, I used to work retail at a place called Bob Warden Sons for like six years off and on. And so the first thing I always ask somebody when they come in is, do you know what size pack you're looking for? And most people mm. don't. Right? right. It might be their first pack. So yeah. the next question is, what type of sleeping bag do you have? Right. Because sleeping bag and tent are the two biggest volume yeah. uh, components mm. in a backpack. And so that's going to help you choose what size pack you're going to need. Right. It's not good to not have enough room. So yeah. So that's the first question I always ask is what type of sleeping bag do you have? Synthetic. Synthetic, do you know? Uh, it's a mountain hardware. Ultra lamina or some type yeah, of? Yeah, the torch. Like the, the oh, yeah. orange one. It's pretty light for the uh, rating. I think it's rated to like minus 18 Celsius or something. Gotcha. Yeah. So that, sorry, you guys I think it's like a three to What's four Fahrenheit? Minus 18. It's a, it's a heavy one. Gotcha. Celsius would be zero Fahrenheit, I think. That sounds right. Because, I mean, your zero is freezing. Yeah, exactly. Right, 32. Yeah. So minus 18. Yeah, that pretty, sounds right. Five degrees, degrees, something like that. Yeah. Um, so that that is going to be a kind of a large sleeping bag, right? It's probably they are, like yeah. three pounds, three and a half pounds, something yep. like that. And so that'll that'll probably take up the bottom. And I don't recommend a stuff sack. So um, you can just kind of compress it down at the bottom and mm. it'll fill up some of that mm. space down below and you can Good use it. you can use that. a stuff sack that's fine as well it's just shaped it gives yeah, you a defined yeah. shape right yeah. and it's all personal preference everyone's going to tell you something different yeah. so with that our 4000 is probably going to be too light because then you're also going to have your insulation you're going out for 12 days yeah. so you need the food yeah. right so you need that storage so our 4000 cubic inch backpack is going to be too small it's mm. it, i mean you might be able to do it but it's going to be tight. It's going to right. be snug. And so I would probably recommend the 6200. And with our with our 6200, the whole concept behind it is, in my opinion, is, our, is comfort and convenience. Weight is always a consideration that we always have. Uh, I think it's 6.4. I want to say it's 6.4 ounces. Six pounds, four ounces okay. is what the Mountain Hauler 6200 results in. But where a lot of companies... I mean, there's a ton of great backpack companies out there. Mission Ranch, Stone Glacier, Kuyu makes a great pack. Mm-hmm. Our pack is going to be designed a little bit more for convenience instead of hip belt pockets, maybe a lid pocket. Ours actually has some organization throughout the entirety of it. I also utilize our meat shelf. So one major difference with our 6200 is that it's an internal meat shelf okay. system. So where other packs you remove, expanded or remove the main compartment away from the shoulders this one is two zips on the inside and expands the bag an extra thousand cubic inches and the meat shelf is built into it so you just drop the hind quarter in cool a couple buckles yeah tighten it down and you go nice right so in the dark really convenient yeah. yeah really easy and so i tend to use that meat shelf when i don't 
carry weight as what's called a trampoline divider. So a lot of pack companies like Gregory Packs, Osprey Packs, they're actually going to have a separate sleeping bag compartment, mm-hmm. right? I don't know if any other hunting brands are really doing that. I don't know all yeah. hunting brand packs. I, I could probably do more research, mm-hmm. but that's convenient for those guys that are doing stop, go hunts. Yeah, yeah. So if you're moving base camp, right? And you don't want to have to repack your bag. Mm-hmm. 6200 has a separate sleeping bag compartment zipper mm-hmm. that you can store basically sleeping bag and tent, right? Everything else above that with the meat shelf. And all you're doing is taking out your shelter and your sleeping bag. Oh, that's pretty right? awesome. Leaving yeah. everything else there. So that way you don't have to repack your bag in the morning. Last thing I want to do is repack a bag. I want, yeah, to, go. Man, I want to be I where I need to be. Um, and so that's where I say convenience. And then comfort, it is designed to comfortably carry loads. I think our max load is like 150 pounds with the 6200, but obviously... I always recommend 80, 90 pounds, just comfort wise. And then it'll carry it. The other variable, and there's a lot of neat details on this pack. But one of those details is that the meat shelf, when you dissect the bag, it is anchored to the frame. So it's not stitched to other material that's stitched to the frame. It is attached directly to the frame for increased stability, Mm -hmm. as well as more comfortable load carrying. So it's directly on the frame. Hmm. Cool. Yep. And then it's um, shelved so it's in the right spot, right? You don't really want your heaviest load at the bottom. Yeah, You want it to be in kind of the swell of your back area, a little bit high up into that pack. So that's where it's really stationed. Does that make sense? That's where it's really kind of built into it. Yeah. Um, And then along with that, we've got features that allow you to carry, you know, a skull a lot more convenient without having to worry about lashing extra strings and you know, paracord to it. Uh, you can do a hind quarter with the antlers, with the additional straps mm-hmm. that come with it. Um, yeah. Cool, man. This is a, a mountain hauler 6200. Sweet. Do you guys have it here? We do. do? Yep. Cool, man. Yep. Um, hope I'd like to check it out. I'll have to swing by there if we have time and mm-hmm. have a peek at that. That's yep. cool. Uh, I honestly, what I think is sick, I've never really thought about packs. I don't know why, but uh, it's cool that you guys We are. haven't, I mean, a, a totally honest we've made a lot of great day packs but yeah. when it comes to meat haulers this is really our first mm. meat hauling cool. pack we're running low on time you got a, a story for us you i can go. conjure up a story i'm pretty <laughs> sure i think we're i think the my favorite story is is certainly my first archery bull yeah my only archery bull <laughs> nice i'm a passionate hunter i think i said this last time i'm a passionate hunter Maybe not the best hunter, <laughs> archery-wise. But, uh, you know, spend a lot of time in an area uh, back in Montana. And everything was really quiet. It's so elk hunt in Montana. I decided to just sit in a stand because nothing was talking. I couldn't locate anything. And it was dry. And I felt like I was just blowing everything out, right? Like I couldn't be quiet enough. And so I spent several days in tree stands just being patient and tried to be as patient as I can because typically I'm not a patient hunter. That's why I end up spooking everything when I'm on the ground. So I decided Mm -hmm. let's just sit. So I'm sitting, I stand on day four and finally in the evening with like 15 minutes of shooting night, hear a bugle. It's the first bugle Mm -hmm. I've heard and I'm jazzed, right? Like, okay. So I pack out, I come right back in and I'm about 15 minutes of shooting light, getting myself organized, and I hear that same bugle go off. And I'm in the right spot, and I'm in the bedroom. And so I move in, give a cow call, and I'm solo. So I give a uh, just a, a single, just mew. Nothing right. like lost cow, nothing hot, anything like that, just a mew. And I move about 20 yards to a little tree, and I've already figured out what tree I wanted before I made the, the cow call. And I hunker down, and I'm notched. But I forgot to pull my face mask up. It's on. Like, I've got it. I've got a core lightweight hoodie on. It's there. It's around my chin. But I forgot to pull it up. And just as I got to that little bush, here comes a cow straight at me. Hmm. I'm followed by a bull. I'm terrible at scoring, but it's one of the biggest bulls I've, I've seen face to face. And she comes to 12 yards, and she stops, and she sees my morning face, hmm. like, right there. And she just stares at me. And I, I, had the, I was at least able to move my bow to break up. Right. Right that pale face of mine (laughs) and so she turns broadside and she just moves in front of me about 10 yards and i'm knocked clipped she keeps moving slowly and the bull has no idea he hasn't seen anything by this time i've brought my face mask up uh, when she was looking away and she just kind of meanders around me almost Hmm. and the bull's following 22 yards and i'm drawn back 
and I've got a shooting lane and I'm, I'm knocked. I'm just waiting for him to step in and he steps in. And now I see just fingers of branches in between him and I that I couldn't see, um, at that low light. And I let down and I sat there and the bull, you know, the biggest bull I've ever had in front of me. And like, what did I say? Like 22, 28 yards, somewhere around there. Just, they just meander away. Right. And I, obviously I'm just, I'm kind of like, like, I don't want to cuss on, on, uh, You're more than recorded, welcome to. But, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> but it was exciting, right? It's always exciting when you come that close. So I back out, right? Uh, again, trying to be patient. I'm not going to try to call him back in. You know, the cow was already kind of curious of me to begin with, and I just didn't want to ruin that spot anymore. So right. I sat there, let them kind of meander away from me, and then I backed out. Went back to camp, which we've got a cabin. I won't say where in Montana, nice. but we've got a cabin. And so I get back, and, you know, my wife is there, uh, my in-laws, and we make breakfast and, you know, hang out. And I know I'm going back in there, right? right? Uh, I didn't necessarily blow those elk out, so I'm hoping that they – hang out and my wife and I go in we wait a little bit longer because I don't want to sit there for too long and disrupt that area it's only about a mile off the road and my wife's with me and before we go in right we're in the vehicle at the gate and I hand her a hoochie mama and I'm like all right and I use a reed she's practiced with a reed her dad's exceptional Mm -hmm. our dad's pretty much I I talked to you guys in the Mm -hmm. last one right and so I handed her the hoochie mama and I'm like, okay, listen, I know this thing's so simple and it seems straightforward, but you can mess it up. Like in that moment when you're so anxious and excited, like you can totally mess it up. So if you mess it up, right, you get the E right. instead of the full compression, just like give it five seconds and then give it a, a go again. So we joke about it and she's making fun of me like, I'm not going to mess this up. Right. It's, a, it's a hoochie mama, come on. So we go in and we slowly make our way in really quiet don't call. And we get to a spot and we sit down and we're down for like 30 seconds and an elk bugles, same exact spot that that bull was. And I'm just like, okay. So we wait and I want to hear, cause he's up on a ridge and typically they come down and I want to know where he's going to be before I move. And so we wait, we wait, we wait. It's probably like 30 seconds. And then I get so anxious and I go, right. I felt like five minutes, but it was really probably only 30 seconds. So we make a move and I try to find that doorway. So that's the one thing that uh, I learned is the doorway technique. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but the idea of the doorway is with elk understanding where they're going to see the cow, right. Mm -hmm. They're going to know that something's supposed to be there. And so a lot of hunters are always curious about, why did that bull only get to 80 yards? Why didn't he come into 40? Right. Why did he hit up at 100? Well, it's because the bull can see what he's supposed to see and he's not seeing anything, right? right. right? So you got to find that doorway. Uh, I believe it's real hunting resources and huh. uh, that I, I kind of started to understand this. And, and what that just simply means is, let's say you're trying to find your wife in the house. Well, you don't open the door, walk around the bed to the corner of the bed and say, honey, are you here? Right. You open the door and say, honey, are you here? Right. And then you look in the room and then you leave. Mm-hmm. You don't walk to the corner to right. make sure she's not there. Well, elk are the same way. They're not going to walk to the corner to see if you're a cow elk standing there. Mm-hmm. So you got to find that doorway. So we're searching for the doorway, trying to see with the contour of the land. It's pretty flat. And so we slowly move. And finally, I'm like, okay, I think this might be a spot. So I set my wife up and I get about 20 yards from her and a cow right in front of me. 20 yards, another cow, 20 yards. And they're moving pretty quick. And so I kind of look to my left and there's the bull. And so I draw back right away and I've got the reed in my mouth and I'm just waiting. And the bull steps into a shooting lane and there's more branches. And like, this is all happening so fast that I'm just like, shit, not again. And so I have to move around a tree as he's moving from my left to my right. And I'm still drawn. And all of a sudden I hear a, (laughs) <laughs> and it was the best thing because I go in five seconds, she's going to give an actual cow call. Right. And so she does, she pushes the, um, pushes the hoochie mama, stops mm-hmm. the bull at 32 yards, perfectly quartering away release. And in about 10 minutes, I got my first bull. Wow. wow. Yep. Cool. So it was, uh, it was also like the day after our anniversary. Oh, nice. It's uh, like all encompassing, just a phenomenal experience. That's cool, man. For both of us. And I mean, bull, you know, he died 
I'd say probably 50 yards away. So right. it was a clean shot. And Excellent. Nice. We only had one meat hauling pack. And so my wife wanted to take a hind quarter out. So she packed, I packed like the tenderloins in this little <laughs> tiny day bag and she took a hind quarter out and I'm so glad I didn't run into anybody on her way out. <laughs> yeah. But she did that. And then we came, I, I, we went back in, I took a hind quarter out and then we came back in for the quarter in the morning. Sounds like uh, she's front a shoulders. Yeah. I love my wife. <laughs> Good. She's pretty badass. Yep. Cool. Awesome, yeah. man. That's a great story. We haven't really experienced elk like that and just kind of visualizing this story while you're telling it, I could just feel my heart pounding because I bet it's pretty intense when they're that distance from yeah. you and you've got one shot, especially with a bow. It's yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, that's what that draws me there. Everyone asks me like, what are you doing this year? It's always elk. Like right. that's, it's, it's just, it's so much fun and strategy. And yeah. it's not as, like you said, it's, there's so many variables. It's yeah. not as simple as just getting close enough. There's so many things that can play into success. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Cool. Anything else you want to add before we wrap up? No, I don't, unless you guys. No. <coughs> it's a good way to end right there. <laughs> Just coughing into the microphone. Yeah. Sorry, everybody. Well, we appreciate you coming in with uh, the state of your, your vocal cords. So thanks. The a lot. show crowd. It's, yeah, what did I say? I can't remember. I started it on Thursday last week. So we're Saturday now. So nine days in. Yeah. Yeah. So talking and. Picked it up in Harrisburg, Great American Outdoor Show. Nice. It's a fun, fun event, but. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Perfect, man. Well, we'll do this again sometime soon, I'm sure. Appreciate I hope time. so. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. We will. Maybe yeah. I'll maybe yeah. I'll figure out how to sneak into your spot in August and just like surprise you guys with with some <laughs> hey. donuts and cupcakes. <laughs> with and, a hoochie mama. <laughs> with a hoochie mama. Yep. yep. Perfect. Oh, man. I don't, I mean. I do not hunt with a hooshi mama, but they they can be they can be useful. Maybe we'll do a. Uh, you can teach us some stuff about elk on the next one. Sounds good. All right, let's do it. <laughs> awesome. Cheers, thanks, man. man. Cheers. Yeah, thanks, guys. This episode of Rookie Hunter was also brought to you by North Arm Knives. North Arm Knives are handcrafted and sold directly through a father and son team right here in British Columbia. Choose from a selection of outdoor knives, kitchen knives, and custom engravings from NorthArmKnives.com. They ship internationally and guarantee all of their work. Kelly and I have put their products to the ultimate test and give them our stamp of approval. Head over to northarmknives.com.